Welcome, my name is Tom Manners. On Twitter, I'm at Manomatics, and you're watching Resourceful number seven. Somewhat confusing as Resourceful number eight was released earlier this morning, but that's fine. I organised number eight afterwards. So this make this some sense to it. So please don't um, have a go at me for not being consecutive in my numbers. But what's most important is the content today and the answer. But then again, do we have answers today? Because today's topic is something quite particular. It's a lovely kind of uh, lovely task which can be introduced into primary and secondary classrooms, and it takes away so much of the stress. Now, of course, this series of interviews, I've been asking people who created these or have used these resources in their classroom to come on and talk about how they use it. And that's been the whole point of the series. We've had people just explaining how they use it. Do you know when you get given something, but you don't know how to use it unless we talk it through. And I've been really fortunate that every single time um, I've been doing these, I've had people just share so many great ideas. Uh, I've got two people returning to the show already because they've, they share so many resources online that, of course, they are um, going to be on it regularly, I would hope. But also a third guest as well, talking about goal-free problems, Alison Jagger, Gene Knapp, Pete Mattock. Come on down! Dun, 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 dun. Hello! And there Hello, Tom! Hello, how are we doing today? <laughs> it's the end of term. I think, Pete, you're already on break, though. You're, you're, you've already taken your time off. So uh, nice yep. to you every day, which is uh, lovely for you. Uh, but for the re for the rest of us, a couple more days to go. Um, Alison, thank you for the first time on Resourceful. Yes, great to be here. And um, I think uh, maybe I'm wrong, but you were sharing Goal Free Problem before the Goal Free website that Pete then created. Yeah. I think that's right. Yes, I, I bet him to it on that one. <laughs> and then he just stole the idea, ran with it a bit further. Um, so I'm hoping you two are friendly in this <laughs> Let's oh, absolutely. <laughs> now, uh, Pete and Jean, you've been on before. So, Alison, we're going to come straight to you and find out a little bit about you. If you can tell us about your teaching journey. Yeah, so I've been a teacher for five years um, in the same school. Um, I've been deputy curriculum leader for four years. And then I'm moving school in September. Um, exciting new role as associate assistant principal. And I'll be NQT and ITT coordinator. So really excited about that one. Now, you're Alison Jaggers, but that website, Jaggers Maths, has not always been Jaggers Maths. No, I got married last year. So I stayed as Miss Banks at my current school, but now I'm moving school. I thought I'll rebrand and come out as Mrs. Jagger. So I've changed it to Jaggers Maths now. So you do, because um, when I started the, these ideas of these websites, uh, with this kind of series, your previous website name was given to me. I was like, isn't that Jaggers Maths now? Yeah. Um, so yes, I thought that was you. Uh, so I, I, of course, when you're live, I really should have asked you before that. <laughs> um, but but never mind. Now, on your website, uh, you share a number of resources, and hopefully we'll have a look at it later on. Uh, but today is all about goal-free. Uh, goal-free, um, in fact, I'll share my screen because uh, what I've got is the PowerPoint that I share my, with my trainees. Um, let's just quickly remind ourselves what hopefully the session is going to be, an introduction to goal-free problems, including the research behind their use, most of it from one particular paper, uh, but we'll certainly refer to it. We're going to talk about the benefits of using these tasks, both in the primary and the secondary classrooms. Where can you find them? Um, Alison, Pete and Gina have shared loads of these, which is why I'm, I'm so pleased they're, they're joining me today. Again, how to use them um, and how to introduce the tasks. I think that's really important because if you haven't got that uh, awareness or the pupils haven't got that comfort with what to do with them, then they can fall flat. Uh, it's also like any new task. So it's important that you per persist maybe, uh, but also you introduce it to make sure it's the most engaging way of doing it. And we're going to find out what Alison's favourite online resource is. We will take questions on YouTube Live for you watching on YouTube and on Twitter with that hashtag resourceful, if anyone uses that, I don't know. Uh, so the one website that um, maybe a lot of this come from is the Goal Free Problems, which Pete, one of many, many, many websites that Pete's been willing to make to share with so many people. Uh, and if we just look at the, the line, which so Pete, I, I've, got to, I've quoted it from your website, so I'm afraid you've got to back this up. Uh, goal free <laughs> problems have been proven to support pupils improving their knowledge and understanding by removing the cognitive load of the goal, therefore not prompting means end analysis of the problem. Translate. <laughs> yeah, so for me, the example I always like with this is do you remember the slider puzzles that create a picture? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you get one of those and you start sliding it around and eventually, normally, you end up creating the picture. And do you, do you remember the steps you took to create the picture? Of course you don't. You never no. do. Nobody <laughs> does. Nobody ever remembers. They always end up with the picture and nobody ever remembers how what steps they took to get the picture. 
and for me, that's what the idea the idea of goal free bombs is all about. And that's that means end analysis. You are so focused on creating the picture that actually the steps you take, you're not cognitively cognitively aware of at all. So the way goal free problems work is by removing the goal and just saying, what can you do? What can you bring to this? What can you get from this? You know, it would be equivalent to saying, what moves can you make? Just talk to me about the moves you can make. Don't worry about trying to create the picture. What moves can you make with that? And that, because you are more cognitively aware of what it is you're doing and what it is your thinking is, rather than just, I've got to try and make the picture and not really having an awareness of what it is that's going on in your head to do that, because you're more cognitively aware of what it is you're actually doing, you, the, the theory suggests, at least, that you learn from that better than you would from actually trying to solve a problem where you are a relative novice in that area. And the novice expert relationship is quite important in that. Um, you know, if you're a relative novice in that area, then then trying to solve an involved problem with a goal, you the, the research suggests that you don't necessarily learn much from that because you're not focused on the actual steps, you're focused on the so, I mean, I think a lot of the paper, um, the research comes from this goal free effect from Sweller, uh, and I happened to just Google that's, it very quickly. Uh, and I found the paper. So I, I just went Googling story of research program, John Sweller, um, and just kept Googling. I realized uh, this is the paragraph that I particularly liked, I seem to recall. Um, here it is If working memory during problem solving was overloaded by attempts to reach the problem goal, best preventing learning, then eliminating the problem goal may allow working memory resources to be directed to learning useful move combinations. Like you just said, the move combinations. That's, That's it. That's well, entirely the point. The idea is you're supposed to be recognising in that sort of situation, this is what I did. And so when you come to similar problem types, it doesn't overload your working memory because you've got that in your long-term memory. But... If, you, if you're a relative novice at that and you're just trying things and you're just, you know, a bit of trial and improvement or whatever else, you don't then create those associations in memory. Alison, you, uh, I think, as I said before, I think you were the first to uh, start sharing them online. Um, how did you start to use these and what attracted you towards them? Um, the reason I started using them was because of a exam paper that my year 11 class did. So I had a year 11 class of um, foundation students aiming for a grade five. Um, and they went and sat their first paper, um, paper one of GCSE. And they came out and they'd done a question, which was um, like a compound area of a circle question. I've got it if I can share it with you. Please do. So this is the question. Can you see that? Yeah. 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 So this is the question. Um, and all of my students came out of this exam saying they'd found area. Even though the question says perimeter in bold, they all came out. Well, most of them did anyway, saying, oh, I found the area when, when they were describing the problem to me. And I thought, what have I done wrong there? Because I'd done a lot of work on compound area of shapes. So they'd just seen this question and, and not even read the question. They'd just assumed it wanted area. Um, so I was actually stood in a lunch queue on an inset day, talking to my old head of department. Um, we were chatting away. And she said she'd gone to a conference um, about with Mr. Barton Maths, and it, um, he'd explained about goal-free problems. And that, that's where the the, 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 the the piece of paper is stuck in on the goal-free page when I was just yeah. reading it a few minutes ago. And I think that was before his book came out. He'd mentioned it in a conference, um, and then I read it in his book as well. But I, I loved the idea so much, I thought that might be the answer to my problem, in that if I give students some information rather than a question attached and say what could the question be it's just a way of showing them that actually it's not necessarily what you think it's going to be you can't just assume from the diagram from the picture what the question is so that's why i started developing them because i just love that idea and created loads to use in my gcse classes gene um a primary specialist how about yourself what, what kind of has drawn you towards it is it similar experience with regards to the pupils in secondary or is it something different well, I started off looking at, um, you know, um, the Goal Free Problems website and a lot of those I could use with my top set year sixes. Mm -hmm. But then I was asked um, about three years ago when I got back into the classroom to do a remedial class um, for girls 
problem solving and they were not very confident at all. And this was to support them. So I started to create some of my own from that point forward. Um, and it's only this lockdown period where I've managed to put these whole banks then together as, as I've wanted to. But for those girls, I think that it really started to turn things around for them. And that is why, you know, we're now three years in. So I feel absolutely convinced that it has such an impact and the confidence I saw from those girls. And it's when you look at those and then eventually you return to the original problem that is no longer goal free. It's actually goal led mm -hmm. that they find that they can solve that with such ease. It, and it's such a shame but, the stress is put on, isn't it? I mean, it, it feels like it's just the stress of getting it right, because apparently maths is just about getting it right mm. and getting the answer. Uh, and that's the, the scary thing is when we teach maths. I mean, I love the expression, the answer is only the beginning. Um, but there's such an opportunity. You mentioned about girl stress, and so I've got to mention this mug now. Uh, a lovely people uh, made me this years ago. So, Mr. I'll hold it up. Mr. Manners and my messages when I was teaching are be positive. Get the first mark. Show what you know. These are expressions I use in the classroom quite a lot. Now, I wasn't doing goal free, but I was saying, look, just show me something because the first step might lead to a next step. And the next step might lead to the third step and so on and so forth. Because you can't, you can't lose marks in an exam, you can only gain them. So you show me what you know. And I think actually that's the premise of the goal free, I would, I would, I would imagine. That it show the information that you do know. And then when you're given the goal led, oh, I, I actually know some of the steps already. Uh, Pete, what about yourself? Because obviously you've created the website now. Uh, yeah, so very similar, actually. And that, that exact phrase is the one that I use in all my exam briefings. The exam is an opportunity to show what you know. So obviously as a head of department, when I'm briefing, I've got all the kids together in the hall for, for prior to their G, they go and sit GCSE exams. Not that they've done that this year, but when we're doing mock exams and things like that, that's the exact phrase that, that I use is, the exam is an opportunity to show what you know, find those places where you can do some maths. And that's the first starting point. But for the goal three, it, it, and Jean's right, it's about then go beyond that and associating what you've done with future problem types, because that's where the learning comes from is actually, OK, now that I now that I can see all the different ways that this might go or I've, I've got experience of some of the different ways that this might prompt some of the different maths this might prompt me to do when I then come across a problem that asks me this specific thing I've learned more about where I need to build up to that point because a lot of the exam questions that we're talking about of course they're questions where you can't necessarily answer it based on the information you've immediately been given mm -hmm. you've got to develop some information for yourself and Pete made such a good point that he, he chose to froze at, uh, freeze at that one and pass on to the rest of us. Um, so with regard to the benefits of these tasks, uh, I think that, uh, Gene, you've, one that I came across on a personal level was the, the confidence to be able to problem solve. That's one of the biggest benefits for me. Um, what else have you seen as those benefits of the tasks? And then Alison as well. Everyone, everyone can take part. Everyone knows something about that diagram or that table or that graph. Um, everyone can contribute. The richness and vocabulary as well, I think, is also very important. But in terms of the interpretation of graphs, tables, diagrams, they're a separate skill as well. And often when we've got those to look at and the problem as well, it's yeah. just too overwhelming. And actually just focusing on the skill of interpreting a table, interpreting a graph, et cetera, I think is an important one that we need to isolate anyway, um, regardless of goal free. But yes, the open endedness that everyone can achieve. Uh, Alison, before I come to you, I'm just going to check. Cause I think you've, you've used a couple of words there, um, Gina, I particularly want to go to. So I just click on, I click around on my screen somewhere. Um, I saw this blog that somebody had shared on the White Rose Maths website and the goal-free problems in mixed attainment. 
And you mentioned there, uh, Jean, about the, the language. You know, some students might just simply notice things. There was a really interesting blog. And again, because mixed attainment is being talked about a lot more than maybe ever before, some might want to impress with vocabulary. Um, everyone, it, it's accessible to everybody, even if you just say what you see without having to um, coin a catchphrase, catchphrase. Um, but it is, it, it is say what you see. And, but in that respect, now do it, speak like a mathematician, tell me what, you know, and, and the, the relationship between those words. What have been the benefits in your classrooms, um, Alison? And I'm going to get your website up while, while you're, you're, you're suggesting that. I think I'm just going to echo basically what you've just said, that um, it, it is open-ended, that any student can access it and, and take part. So if you've got a class that's quite um, a big gap, like our mixed attainment class, which I think a lot of us are going to experience in September, um, you know, it's open to everyone and everyone can um, create a problem from the information that you give them. Um, I'm on your page, draggersmaths.co.uk, and you, you mentioned here, actually, just to um, allow students to create and answer their own questions, uh, which is quite nice, actually, because they can say, oh, I might be being asked this, so I'm going to write that one down and, 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 again, show what you know, yeah. that, that Pete suggested. Um, super stuff. So here's an example of, of, of a couple of you. I'll, I'll leave this on here. Now, actually, you've got two versions here. Um, so can you talk us through what you're thinking when you say structured and unstructured? Uh, just the reason for that was that um, in, in my experience, in my classes, I do a lot of open-ended um, tasks, um, particularly for extension tasks as well. Um, my extension tasks are never new content or just harder material. It's always something almost mastery style or like the open middle kind of tasks. So my students, when I give them a goal three, they're quite adapt in, to this method of working. Um, if I say, oh, here's some information, create a problem, they're quite good at that because I do a lot of that work anyway. Um, but if you want to give your class a little bit more of a breakdown, like think of some questions and work out the solution, it's just a little bit more structured. So it's not as overwhelming just having like a big blank um, space to the right hand side. Nice scaffold to, to support that. Lovely. Um, I think I'm going to ask you all at one stage to, to share the kind of examples, one that you particularly enjoyed in the classroom. And uh, we'll certainly get to what problems may arise in the classroom as well, but where you use it in the learning journey. And I'm certainly at the moment thinking for my mixed attainment classes for next year, I'm thinking this is a great um, anchor task just to get them chatting in them immediately and maybe writing down what they see and then sharing as pairs. So a starter task might just work. Uh, but Jean, I know you... Um, be, well, you, you're incredibly impressive as always, the stuff you share, but you shared, you sent me a PowerPoint yesterday, so I need to hand over to you, because I know you've got so much prepared, because uh, I know you can show us a couple of examples of how you use them as well. So, yeah, um, I've, I'll just show you a few examples. Please do. Um, because I, I think, as with always, I've overplanned this. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, for example, here. So um, here we've got an example of a key stage two problem and um, we've got obviously a um, one that is goal led and another that's goal free um, but we could go one step further beyond that and just have those stickers and their prices the amount of um, goal freeness that you have in the in the problem can also change the responses you get from the children, how much you're willing to still keep in that original problem and how much you actually want to strip away. So that's also something to consider. But if you've got key stage one, it might not be a case of getting a word problem, but um, in the NCTM innovation that I've just recently finished leading, a lot of the key stage one teachers were using lovely pictures, which of course come from the whole mastery way of teaching that we often in key stage one start with a picture and here we have a picture and children again just saying what they see in that picture and then creating problems from that picture so it doesn't have to be a word problem it could quite easily be a picture um, one thing I'd really recommend if you want to stick it in with the real life is to um, take pictures of supermarket deals, car park um, tariffs, you know, and you've got yourself there then a goal free problem. Um, so uh, there's, there's lots of scope for that. I think I'm, I'll stop there. But um, on my website, there is an, a blog post on goal free 
with with the resource where I've taken the key stage one, key stage two sats, all of them so far, and made them goal free. I think you've uh, if some of them are on your PowerPoint, let's not look at them now. Don't 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 um, be shy, Jean, because I know you've prepared a lot more of this, so it'd be a shame not to at least um, use some of them if they are there. So let's. I mean, by the way, I mean here is an example of a year three problem that is quite involved. So they're really asking if you've got this many sugar cubes and you're using this amount of sugar a day, obviously there's real uh, health concerns there over someone having that much sugar on a daily basis, but never mind. Um, if that's the case, I sort of like the idea of, you know, even turning it into something more relevant that they might know because sugar cubes you know who has those these days so here we've got ice cubes and we just play around with the idea you know how many ice cubes um how many drinks and then we can go to the actual sugar itself and then we return to the problem and then it's so much easier to get there by opening it up and even making it goal free in a different context that's more relevant to them. Um, so that's the sort of primary side of things. In terms of the resources then, so um, so my blog has got um, a, an article about goal free. And so the idea was that to create a resource that I know I'm going to be dipping into now myself because I was having to do this ad hoc. Um, so taking all key stage one, key stage two problems from the, um, the SATS papers and making them goal free um, because, you know, the SATS are such a rich resource of, of goal free. Um, so, you know, if you, you know, let them have another life and so that you can actually, you know, turn them into something super useful and um, I really like that. And uh, the the only other thing I would say is that this book from ATM, um, Thinking for Ourselves, I really like that book. Um, it contains lots of ways into Goal Free as well. And um, it was written some time ago now, uh, 13 years. So um, it's, it's aged incredibly well. It's got some really um, so many different things but there's a whole section there that is about questioning from something that is fairly open-ended um, and it was actually from that book also that was an inspiration to me at primary level I think it's it. worth, I think I think we should share your website so I'm going to um, make sure that is pointed out so people won't know where to go so Sadly, when I'm using um, zoom I can't see the top of the screen always so uh, here we are this is yours um, so where do we look for from here? Is it within resources? Um, so no, if you go to blog. <laughs> why, why would it be in resources? <laughs> there you go. So into blog, yeah. And it's, there's a blog post called Goal Free and all the resources are at the end of that blog. Okay, well, I've tried to do a search goal, but that's me uh, not being able to find it. But it, it's there somewhere. So if yeah. I go follow my blog... Uh, in fact, there's the more same less, which we talked about a few uh, a few weeks ago. Um, well, I, I can't find it initially, but uh, that, I, that's good. I'm stressing and trying to do it really quickly, so I'll ignore yep. that for just a moment. Let's go to your website, Pete, uh, which I think is just here. Um, any? Can you talk us through? I mean, I, I, I'm hoping it's pretty self-explanatory that you've divided them into number algebra uh, and so on. How have you got some of the resources for this? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I started basically um, it, going back to saying how you used them. The first pro the first place I was really was in revision. Uh, and that's one of the two main places that I still use them uh, is when I'm uh, doing revision with students. Um, mm -hmm. And I can talk about the other one in a minute. So I was create I was basically taking exam questions very similar to what Gene did with the SATs. But I was taking Edexcel um, exam questions because they're freely available. Um, and I was just finding the ones that were suitable to become goal free uh, and just creating those like for students in classes and things like that. And I sort of just got into it. It was once, I think, as I recall, it was one sort of Sunday and I was creating a few and I was just like, well, I, I can put a bank of 20 together here. And then I put a bank of 20 together and then I put another bank of 20 together and another, and another, and, and I split it down by topic. And by the end of, literally, by the end of that day, I had I had built a website to host sort of 
a hundred or more um, things. And then people started um, contributing. You know, I've got some great ones from Suffolk Mass and a few other people, obviously. Alison's herself have, have, have featured on there. So, um, yeah, people just started contributing then. And that's when I started adding sections. I didn't have a mixed topic section to begin with. Um, but I added the, the mixed topic section when people started sending me mixed banks of problems and things like that. And it just, it, you know, just added a few in. And then it's, it, you know, what's there now is there. I mean, looking at this one here, I mean, that's the kind of question that would be a th maybe three, four marker, maybe more. And a lot of people who immediately just turn around and go, no, no, thank you. And turn over the page because there's an immediate fear of I don't know where to start. And I think that's exactly. the point. I think that's the point of these that it, it, it's that almost that first step to having a go, get the first mark, show what you know. I mean, getting the first mark sadly puts it that we're talking about passing exams because we want them to be confident learners. Um, so Alison, how have you created your own? Is it really, is there a strategy to this or is it each question a little bit different that you just take away the last line, um, which it may well be sometimes? How have you created yours sometimes? Yeah, it is just looking at um, exam questions um, or from any other bank that I've got of, of questions and just taking off the question really. Um, sometimes I do change it a little bit or I might remove a little bit more so that it's a little, bit, it's more open-ended. So remove... I might remove like an extra line there on that question, for example. Um, but yeah, they're really easy to create. So I started creating some using my template. And then the next thing I know, Pete had created a website with like hundreds and hundreds. And I thought, oh, there's no need for me to do this anymore. I can just use yours. Yeah, because they're so easy <laughs> to create. So let's talk about how to introduce these to the classroom. Should we start with primary and work up? How you introduce these tasks? Because hopefully we've shared the benefits uh, and what you get from the, the interaction. If there's more, actually, please do share them, obviously, as we go on. Uh, but how have you introduced them, Jean, and how have you encouraged primary practitioners to introduce them? So really just introducing, say, for example, it was a table or um, a um, special offer, um, to get children just simply to say, well, you know, how, what do you know about this? What can you tell me about this? Um, because I want to immerse them in it straight away before then we look at, well, now you know this, this is going to help you do this. So that they've gone through that process and they see then how that's going to be helpful to them in the next step. I think it does take I would say one or two lessons before the children get more familiar with that process. Um, but I often will show them one and then they will often um, just, I will put it on a big sheet of A3 because I want them to scribble all over it. It's messy. That's how it has to be. Um, and they're, they're scribbling all over it. If I'm in key stage one, I would be a scribe um to have one up on the board but then so they're scribbling all over it and then i would get them to pair up and if there's something they notice from a friend's that was not on theirs they can add that as extra so they're teaching one another and then we'll have a discussion about what they found and then i will often then introduce the goal led version of the same thing so that they can sometimes they would have come up with the actual question that was in the gold led version but not always but that's in, that's an interesting point because we're not doing it so children will end up predicting um the actual question that's not what we want them to do we just want them to come up with observations but sometimes they actually do that um successfully but all, there's power and lots of um, benefits from all the other questions the children have come up with as well so um, yes I mean sometimes just as a starter what do you notice about this and then next day starter let's bring it back and now let's have a look at the goal led version so it's wherever you can fit it in two or three of these could easily make up an entire lesson I find in primary um, or just what do you notice and then return to it the next day it could be a starter. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just where you want to fit it in. Pete, what about how you introduce it to your classes and then also where do you use it in the learning journey? 
So, yeah, it's interesting because, like I say, it's in a few different places and very often it doesn't need. I think the one that need, that's needed most introduction in my experience is when I'm using it for revision because the first time kids are really wary of it if they're doing it for revision because they're not answering an exam question and they get a bit sort of, you know, I should be answering exam questions, sir, to prepare for exams. And it's like, well, no, actually, if you do this, you're actually answering four or five or six different exam questions because they're the things that you do. And importantly as well, if you do this, I know the things you're not thinking about. And that when you when I do it for revision, that's a re that's a, that's an important part of it for me, is I can see the question, the, the math that they're not applying, the things they're not doing with that problem as much as where they are. But in, in the course of it, I mean, I, I use these all over the place in the course of a general lesson. You know, I mean, recently with year 10, we were looking at solving equations. And rather than just you know put an equation up and do the steps to solve it it was put an equation up tell me another equation that's true if this is true and that's you know that was it so i had something like 3x plus 2 equals 17 or whatever it was tell me what tell me something else that's true if this is true and there for that i might just give them you know a note, an example or two so if 3x plus 2 equals 17 3x plus 5 equals 20 is something else that's true if that is true and then it's just figure out loads, figure out what you can, figure out as many as you can, figure out what you can do with it. Get in, and all there is just to get them comfortable in in sort of manipulating equations in any way they, uh, you know, in any way they feel comfortable. And it's not really, you know, you don't call it goal free and you don't introduce it as goal free, but it's an alternative to just here's an equation, here's some steps to solve it. Because actually, what I want them to do is just to get familiar with the idea of working with this as an as a as a construct. And you do that all the time. I play pointless with kids. Gene talked about putting, um, you know, stimuli like tables or graphs up and, you know, what can you see? I play pointless with kids around that all the time. Find, figure out things about this. See if you can come up with something that nobody else comes up with. Pointless, you know, game game of pointless around that. There's the six, te six teams in the room, so your maximum is five. Who, How many points do you get? Do all the other five? to get it you know that sort of thing and it's not you don't introduce it as goal free but it's it's just something to get them to think about this and what it can do rather than trying to do something specific and you learn a lot more from it and i'm realizing more and more we, it's, it's in the national curriculum that uh, maths is an interconnected discipline and just one stimuli can come up with all these different connections and then the pupils realize that as well and oh wow these aren't just these you um individual topics that you taught us it's as if you were telling us the truth the whole time that maths just <laughs> being connected um Alison, how is there a, a way that you introduce them but also i'll ask you first on this as well is there a style of marking these or assessing these or is that really a dangerous area to go towards so first and foremost how do you introduce them but then how do you use them for your assessment yes yeah, so i do a lot of activities like like pete just mentioned i call that one um show and tell so they have to come up with a an answer like the best answer they possibly can what do you think is the most obvious answer what do you think is something no one else is going to think of what's your best answer and why is it your best why do you define it as best and then we have show and tell so like uh, one person from every table will have to say what's their their um contribution for their group um so i think doing these kind of activities on a regular basis means that the goal free just kind of comes naturally to them anyway because they're used to attempting these prob like creating their own problems um so when i give this like i said when i give these to my classes they were just yeah i can create the hardest uh, problem i possibly can uh, one way i like to do it so i do it for revision as as pete said um, revision is a great way to use it um another way is for homework i like to give it for homework and say can you create a, a really complex problem and then the next lesson you're going to swap it with your partner and you're going to answer each of us question so they have to come up with a question they have to do a model solution and a bit of a mark scheme to go with it and then they come and they swap them in the lesson and they have to attempt each of us problem because it gets them really competitive that they want to come up with something that's going to stump their partner in the next lesson so that's a really nice uh, way to do it um, and then as you said before, I did think it'd be really good in September, especially when we've got mixed attainment classes for a lot of them, um, as an icebreaker task almost and a way of assessing their, their prior knowledge 
because I can just give them one of these open-ended goal free problems and say, show me what you already know and um, show me what you can do with this question. Um, and it'll get them all chatting and discussing. And I do a lot of think pair share. So I get them to attempt it on their own first, then share with your partner any questions they've come up with. Can you steal any ideas from them? And then as a group as well. Um, what what's the best goal free problem you can create and it's as I circulate around then I can assess um, the students prior knowledge let's go a little bit further into that assessment then because Jean suggested putting them onto a three pages where they can get to explore a lot more um, and then as you as Jean you suggested sharing from other people and, and be able to expand their own kind of paper and, and the achievement of it does anyone want to contribute to anything towards this where would some staff be nervous using these? Was like thinking, well, how am I assessing them? Alison talked about going around the room. You mentioned think, pair, share, but is it whiteboards? Is it holding things up sometimes? How do you get all the information that you want? Uh, Pete, go on. I can see you're kind of adjusting to speak there. <laughs> <laughs> For me, particularly when I mean when I'm doing it, like if I was like the algebra example I gave before something like that i'll just literally hit everybody or hit the majority of the class give me one thing give me one thing you know if i put up something like 3x plus 2 equals 17 and ask them to come up with another equation that's true i'll, I'll hit them all or i'll hit the majority of them and see what they've come up with and where where you know where somebody's given something that's incorrect i'll feed it back and we'll we'll do a lot of that when i'm doing it for revision and and written things the, these tend to be the things that actually I want to take in and I want to look at. Because like I said before, from from these, I get two really crucial bits of information. I get the things that they are, the mass that they are bringing to this. So, and whether they're bringing that mass correctly, but they're looking at that, what mathematical ideas are they tying to this problem? What are they seeing? What maths are they seeing in that? And are they able to execute that mass correctly? But the other side of it is I'm seeing what maths are they not bringing to the problem? What has completely passed them by that they're not even aware that they could be doing with this? So when I do this, it like I mean, I don't know how it's going to work next year, but tend to do it in groups, similar to what other people have said, maybe individually first and then sharing. But that's more to limit just what I've got to look at in the end, because I don't want to spend hours and hours doing it. But if I'm looking at maybe five or six groups worth of contributions then i'll actually at some point i'll take them in and i'll sit down and i'll look through those and i'll pick through those and i'll be looking for what mass are they bringing and are they bringing it correctly but also what mass are they not bringing because that tells me then okay so if the purpose was revision i need to be looking at this i need to go back to this and go right well nobody nobody realized that between these two coordinates there was a pythagoras thing that you could have done where you could have found the distance between the coordinates. Everybody was talking about finding the gradients between the points and finding the equation of the line. Nobody went for find the distance. So clearly that's passed you by that you can actually do that in that situation. So I bring that back. I, I, that sounds really, and it's not, a, that's not an arduous thing to mark. You're not checking for answers, are you? Oh, You're God, actually looking no. for topics. And so it's really a, that's it. okay, okay, because I'll never advocate anything that puts extra work on unless the benefit's absolutely there. So um, it's realising that that's... Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking a bit for accuracy. I'm looking for obvious inaccuracies, but I'm not fine-tooth combing it. It's the general strands that I've got. 20... No, no, there's nothing like that. <laughs> no. Uh, is there anything else that anyone wants to share, thinking about the, that the assessing of the task when they do happen, either live, marking, uh, you know, live when it happens or, or afterwards? Is there anything else that anyone's particularly done? Certainly in primary... Um some of the higher marks are in two or three step problems. So I would be looking for them to create more than one step in whatever they do. But also um, research tells us that in primary, it's the compare problems that children find the most challenging. And so how can they take that information and create a comparison problem, for example, might be a really nice way um, to really develop those particular problem types that cause concern. When the uh, GCSE changed, it was the show that question, wasn't it? That there was the most uh, suddenly poorly answered. Yeah, in reality, it was here's the answer. Just show us how to get there. Um, but show what you know, show that. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hoping that comes from this as, as well in goal three. Um, Alison, 
tell me about the problems that we encountered that you know you've encountered and then we'll go around the room as well the problems by bringing these to the classroom and therefore how do you then deal with them um i think some passive learners if you've got passive learners in your class um they I've never heard of a passive learner no one's experienced any of those that's a ridiculous statement <laughs> all my students are always really engaged and really wanting to learn and enjoying maths uh, but on the off chance that i have got a passive learner, they, they, they tend to see this as uh oh well i'll just create a really simple easy question uh, and then i'm done because all all the task is is what what could I find out? Well, I could find out this, and they come up with something really simple, and then they're done. Um, so it's just in, it encouraging them that it's create the hardest problem you can, create something different. What's the easiest problem you can create? And then if you say you're going to swap it with your partner and challenge your partner, sometimes that works if they're really competitive with the person they're working with and say, you need to create a really good question because you're going to then give that to the person sat next to you and give it to them to answer. Um, so that's the main problem that I've encountered in my class. So it's funny because we're seeing more and more now, which I hadn't thought of before, that you, you, you've all kind of alluded to it. Not just the tell me what maths you can tell from this, but what questions can you create from this? Oh, now go and answer those. So the, the, there are two different journeys. And I think I can, you can certainly see that as a powerful thing in, in revision. Uh, Jean, Pete, uh, what issues have you come across? Uh, and this might be going back to the introduction of these uh, into your classroom. But what other problems have you encountered? I would say it's exactly the same as what Alison has just said. Um, I've, it's interesting. It's not necessarily those that are needing the support so much. Um, I've not really had any problems there. It's, it's those that are actually very able to do the maths, but they're not always challenging themselves enough. And I think maybe it's the open-endedness. They'd be quite happy for you to give them something that's goal-led. Um, so I find that sometimes by saying it's got to have this number of parts, it's got to include this, by giving provisions within it, um, that can sometimes challenge them. And yes, a time limit or saying you're going to have to share these in a certain number of minutes they're, they're also motivations, but yeah, it, it tends to be with the upper end, surprisingly. That's because yeah, hundred percent. Well, I would echo that actually. You know, the the ones that are really secure in give me a question, I'll answer it. That's fine. Give, you know, give me some, I'll answer it. It's not a problem. I'll answer <laughs> questions for you all day. But actually, just show me, you know, show me what maths that you can creatively bring to this situation puts them out of their comfort zone they're not used to it they're used to being successful by answering the questions the teacher gives me. so that's that's an interesting uh, one to sort of tackle with students that are, that are like that and students that are used to that that get success from the standard diet of answering whatever the teacher puts in front of me perfectly confidently and perfectly fine and you just got to wean them out of it you've got to see you've got to show them the benefits of it you know, that's, I mean, say, particularly when I introduce them for revision, it, I have to make a big point every year about the benefits of this, that, you know, I take them into the, the cognitive science behind it and all sorts of things, because those kids, actually, then you're having an adult conversation with them, and they, they will respond to that as well. I was Certainly at my level, anyway, at 16 years old, I can't speak for 11 year olds, but at 16 years old. I think that's really powerful sharing with children yeah. why we do what we do. I mean, when I try to introduce bar models to, a, let's say, a year nine class who haven't done it for since primary because they haven't been doing it secondary for whatever reason, um, they'll be turning around. And, and I, I've even shown them where Singapore are in the world and said, well, look at the difference and, and just talked about the science occasionally behind it because you just want them to engage. I think I think treating them like adults in that respect is quite nice. It's a shame that we're almost having to talk about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation here. Uh, and maybe schools would have their own different ways of doing that uh, to try and get that out of some children. And maybe if this was introduced in year seven, so Pete, you said they've had that journey of, well, they're used to being given a question, just answer the question. Um, actually making them realise using words I used earlier on, the answer is only the beginning. I'm more interested in everything else and the connections. And when you build those connections, you could even share the brain science, uh, the, 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 the cognitive science behind it as well. So loads of different ways of, uh, of using them. Adam, I, I'm intrigued. Um, you've not butted in, which I'm going to assume means um, everyone is just fascinated by every minute and we're answering their questions already by predicting everything that anyone's going to say. You've got it, Tom. You've got it. What's, what's been really good, actually, listening to you guys talk is that this is something which I 
have done in the past, but I've just never um, called it a goal-free problem. And it is so useful. And, and the resources which you shared are just fantastic, especially for GCSE. Um, I don't know if you've already answered this, but where do you, obviously we talked about using it in primary school, in secondary school, do you use it throughout um, all years or is there a particular year? Obviously we've like maybe with year 11, it's, it's really useful. Is there a particular year group you choose to do it with? Um, well, like I say, certainly year for revision things, it, it tends to be in year 11, maybe in the run up to year 10 mock exams, things like that as well. But the sort of the, 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 the gentler questions, if you like, they're not based around exam questions. They just, here's a graph, tell me what you know about the graph. Can you find something that nobody else says about it? Or here's an equation. Can you tell me something else that's true based on this equation? Yeah. Things like that. That comes wherever. And you can always find those things, you know. I mean, related calculations going into year seven, you know, if four if four times six equals 24, what else can you tell me that's related yeah. to that? That's yeah. in everybody's curriculum or it blooming well should be. Yes. Yeah. You know, even when it comes to decimals and things like that, you know, that that's in, that should be in everybody's curriculum. But rather than just four times six equals 24, 0.4 times 6 equals what? 4 times 0.6 equals what? 4 times 6 is 24. Tell me something else related to that. Yeah. And then be really happy when you get 8 times 6 is 48 from the kid that that's the only thing that they can tell you about because mm -hmm. they've got no concept of decimals. But that's fine. We'll build to that. But you can at least get involved. You can at least take part. Mm -hmm. Those sorts of things come, you know, wherever you need them. And they're at there is very there are very few areas of mathematics you can't put something like that in yeah i think it's fascinating to see the reminder of all those connections that that you're able to make and again it's that interconnected subject and helping those people realize that the fact that they can get that first mark if they start just maybe just having a go um and i i, I really like the way you've described it gene with those conversations of day three then go and find other stuff as well and go oh that's interesting uh, and I'm hoping we can have those classrooms still in September. Um, I, I can't imagine everyone being sat still in my classroom. It's not, um, given, uh, given I think I've got a two hour break, one hour, they're moving around my classroom, but I'll just make sure they, they've washed their hands. Um, there's, there's, um, there's also one other thing that if you are doing this with very young children, or um, lower key stage two, what often happens, because there's two skills here, it's not just the goal free, it's the creating of a question, which for very young children is very difficult. And quite often what happens is that they will create a question, but you cannot answer it with the information that you've presented. Um, so the, the, the question has been um, incorrectly constructed as well. Um, so a really good question you can ask, and in fact, this could be um, used across the key stages, is what sorts of questions can we create from the information here? And are there any questions we can create where it's impossible to answer from the information that we have? Because when you split those two things, you also are um, making children realize about what is possible from the information and what's not possible and i think with the younger children they really need that i think that's great in secondary um you, you, the points plotted can we sell the distance can can we do pythagoras here why not why can't we do pythagoras how could we then change it to a pythagoras question um so the info do we have enough information when you talk about um I'm thinking side angle side and things like that. Uh, and so well, what can you tell me? Why can't you tell me the other the side? Because we don't have enough information. Now, that's really interesting use of them, actually. Yeah, it's always a good idea to give kids questions they can't answer once they're, once they're secure enough to be able to see it. Uh, you don't give don't give it to them as question one. <laughs> okay, give, it yeah, to, no, no. give it to them as questions. Give it to them as question six or something like that. Something they can't answer if you're not if you're not doing goal three. If you are just you know, using questions and things like that. But yeah, the homework booklets have all at least got one question in that cannot be answered given the information that's there. Because, you know, how, how do you, what's one of the ways you know that a kid really knows the maths is actually when they can look at it and go, no, actually, you've not told me enough there for me to sort that out. Yeah. I'm going to have to make assumptions or I'm going to have to, you know, guess at something or whatever else in order to work that out. And when you've got a kid that can say that to you, that's when you know they know their stuff. 
Mm. We know what to assume makes. Uh, and at that stage, we're going to move on and you're all going to join in whether you like it or not. Now, the first time, Gene and Pete, you weren't, uh, it didn't work. And I, I couldn't I couldn't hear it. So I think I fixed it. The words will be on the screen, ladies and gentlemen. Um, no technical required. I'll explain it. But I mean, the first time people are watching, let's find out. But uh, this is what happened. There's a mess that's been on my mind. It's all Thank you for everyone else joins in. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Yay. Um, it was okay. What's the <laughs> point? Awful, Tom. It's awful. <laughs> the, point, the point of this, uh, this was the original name of the series. I was told it was too negative, but I wanted to point out why I did this. I'm not anti-textbook. I just simply love how much we shared online, which is why I want to create a series and meet people and talk to them about what they've shared. But one of the points as well, the problems with textbooks is when people just pick them up and say, oh, I'm doing this chapter today, do questions one to ten. The idea, of course, a textbook could be brilliant if you engage with it properly and you don't blindly follow questions without giving thought as to why those questions. So the point is, it's no textbook required because you can probably go online. So the question is, uh, and Alison, this is for you this time, because Pete and Jean have been previous guests. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your favourite online resources? I'm hoping everyone recognised the 80s album, by the way, and the, and, and the Phil Collins thing. And if you don't get that reference, then it's... Well, it made me smile every time. Uh, you've chosen three things, Alison, and we'll start with this one. Um, do you know what? Can we start... Why are we starting with any of these when we could be starting with... Wait a second. <laughs> Saga's Mass. <laughs> you need to talk us through this first, please. Oh, it's just a website where I put all of my resources that I've created. So I don't rate it at all. So I'm always really surprised. 20,000 downloads. Give yourself some credit here. <laughs> I'm always really surprised when anyone says, oh my God, we use your re- your website or it's on my Padlet. I'm like, really? Because it's just somewhere where I'm just dumping all my resources um, so you can see them. But that, that's basically what it is. That's all it is. <laughs> oh, come on. I mean, what's, what's R to infinity? This is unique. This is different. I mean, were you doing same surface, different death before Barton as well? Are you just a trendsetter? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think that was afterwards. <laughs> okay, fine. Fair enough. Uh, tell us, go on, tell us about one thing on here that you, you, you look at and go, do you know what? I mean, you, you, you're, you're being um, far. I, don't, I can never get the right word. But you're not giving yourself the credit. Give me some one thing on here that you really are quite proud of. Um... Okay, I re- well, I like my numeracy time resource. That's massive. Let's do it. That's huge. Let's look at this um, then. Talk us through it. So it's a massive PowerPoint with like hundreds and hundreds of slides. Um, and you click through the buttons, uh, pick a year group, um, pick a term. So like summer term one. Um, okay. It's one to six. Um, what do I do here? This, where am I supposed to be clicking? Is this... oh, you need to download the PowerPoint. This oh, is... pardon me. Okay, so, so that obvious sign on the left-hand side saying <laughs> click here to download the resource. Didn't see yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> um, so it says that there's 174 different activities. So it's enough for one a week for the whole of year seven to year 11. So yeah. it's something you could, if you have a numeracy um, in your form time, so a lot of schools do that, or my school used to do, um, it's an activity for that form time. Or if you do an after school club, you could use it for um, after school as well. Some people are using it for that. So you just click through the pathway, click um, year seven, um, um, autumn term one, and then click week one. And it gives you an activity to do with your um, class. And they're all useful for mixed attainment as well, because form groups are often mixed attainment. Um, so they're quite open ended. And some of them are targeted for the time of year as well. So, like, you can see there a Christmas oh. one and an Easter one. So I clicked on the example there. But let me, I'll, I'll go back to the uh, the Christmas one. because that's, oh, that's, like, that's spring term one because um, it's the new year. So spring term one, week one, yes. is when they come back after Christmas, that 2017 one you just clicked. Oh, OK. Um, there, OK, yeah. That's the reason that that's spring term one, week one because you've just gone into a new year. So you could change it to 2021. And then there's like, so autumn term two, week six is just before we break up for Christmas. So it's a Christmas activity. Um, spring term two, week six is Easter. So it's an Easter activity. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it's just like a, most of, some of them are enriched tasks or puzzles or some that I've created. Some of them are just a picture and it's what maths can you spot in this picture? So I created this for my school. So I think in one of them, there's like a picture of a zoo or something because that was the week that they go to Chester Zoo. Oh. 
so it's all like linked in so amazing that, that's that's cool i saw someone asking for this kind of resource on twitter this morning um i would i would have shared that but i definitely yeah, saw, I saw that actually yeah um so talk us about the three set you've chosen three resources uh, three websites that you use a lot alison tell us three so you've chosen go teach maths to start yeah so I've, I've not necessarily picked my favorite i've picked ones that i want to share with people because they might not be aware of them more um so first one is uh, go teach math so they've just got resources on loads of different topics um and it's i like it because it's all the kind of resources i use you know there's lots of uh, like maze four in a row they do like tarsia puzzles um like loads of fun different activities it's not just like tons of worksheets um it's it's different activities um to use and they've just got it on yeah on the browser there's loads of topics yeah, loads of, I, like, I always like seeing work dancers and, and whatnot as well um cool i think you're not the first person to suggest this website actually so it's one i must go back to now this website i know um has been suggested before i'm sure it was joe morgan and i know adam suggests it because he's my head of department i know he's paid for it for my school <laughs> um that's why i'm logged in in the top right uh so talk us through this website because i still don't use it even though we've got it i forget and everyone keeps telling me so why should i be using it um so my school won't pay for a subscription for this um, the current school I'm in. So I pay for my own subscription, which says a lot about how good it is that I'll pay for myself. Um, I absolutely love the interactive side of it for the like transformations, for um, isometric drawing. It, it's just brilliant for that. Yeah, this. So I, I created like a massive smart board um, file with all different transformations on where you can grab the um, tracing paper and rotate it and things like that. But this does it all for you. So I spent so much time on that. And then I saw this website and I'm like, this is amazing. It just does it for you. It's amazing. I, I was going to try and uh, maybe demonstrate, but I don't know what I'm doing, but it's one of those things you've got to play with. So I'm not going to do that while people are watching. Um, and finally, Open Middle, resourceful episode number two. Yeah, so I actually found out about this through your resourceful. Yay! <laughs> That's a lovely thing to hear. So, I, like I said, I've tried to create these problems myself for all the time I've been teaching because I love that an extension task isn't just a oh, move on to how this gets more difficult. It's like, think about the problem in reverse. Can you create your own problem and, and things like that? And this is just a huge bank of them. So I've been creating them myself for ages and they're quite, I find them quite hard to create. Um, but this is just a massive website of them all. So as soon as I saw your episode, I went and you can um, ask them to email you their favorite um, problems. Somewhere on the right hand side. Yeah. Of I mean, this one here, um, I was doing this with the school today. As a matter of fact, we were talking about column addition. And the example on here, which is the one that Robert talked about, I can call him Robert, Robbie, <laughs> uh, as friends would call him, um, that the, the three digit, three, three digit numbers to try and get close to a thousand. And it's really the knowledge of base 10. Um, and it's not just follow the procedure, follow the procedure, it's the knowledge of base 10. And then you could do that same question in a different base if you liked, if you were trying to make sure people, pupils understood the, the, the column the column values. But look at this one here, multiplying two digits close to 7,000. It's continual practice and maybe somewhat related to open middle that you, uh, as part of me, uh, to goal three, is that you're trying to create the perseverance. Yeah. Have a bit more. And again, perseverance is, is it, it's quite clearly stated in the national curriculum, but we'd want that from our learners anyway, wouldn't we? Um, and the other thing about those that are, that are really good, because this is one obviously that I've suggested as well in the, in the episode is, it allows you to tailor the practice to where you need it. If a kid needs a load of practice at multiplying two two-digit numbers, that's what they get. Because yeah. you just tell them, pick numbers, pick digits, put them in there, multiply it, see how close you get to 7,000, pick some more, try it again. If a kid, if what a kid needs is the, is the repetitive practice of doing that, that's what they get. But if there's a kid that's ready to develop that a little bit further and think, what would be good combinations here? How can you tell me why they would be good combinations of the, then you can have that discussion these things where because you know anybody that's been teaching a little while has has been through the the time where you had four or five different worksheets for different abilities <laughs> in inverted commas in the room <laughs> and here you know you get one prompt where can you push it and in, that's where it is very similar to goal three you get one prompt where can you take it where can you push it what can you get out of it which is infinitely better than, you know, here's, here's worksheet number two because you finished worksheet number one. Yeah. 
And do you I know what? Oh, sorry. Go on, sorry. I'll just add as well, my, at my school, we did the math mastery scheme of work for year seven and eight. Um, so we'd have like your highest ability um, uh, sets. I'm going to do it every time, by the way. Having, having to do um, like place value for three weeks. And the teacher were like, they, but they get place value. So what do I do with them? Because they understand it and they do a diagnostic test and score like 100% on it. So where am I supposed to go with that? Um, and that's what these open middle problems are fantastic for because even me, and I'm quite good at maths, um, some of them problems, I come across them and I'm like, I re it really makes me think about how, how do I do this? What's the best way? Um, so even your high stability classes, um, you know, some of them problems, it's really, really going to stump them. So I, I, that's why I absolutely love them. Um, I had like a... Uh, middle class um, and I asked them it, first lesson in year seven what is a number how do you define a number and they looked at me completely blank like no idea what to answer um, and things like why do we round up one on the five and they've like no idea it just completely stumps them and I love questions like that where they think they know everything oh I'm, I know I know place value I can multiply this that's easy but you give them a problem like that which is still just multiplication of two two digit numbers um, but it just really gets them thinking in depth about what they're doing. And because you've reminded me one thing that I, when I work with teachers a lot and, and say, if you've made them think, it's more likely to stick. And it's why it's on my wall always. Memory is the residue of thought because they remember it because you have made them think. Uh, and you all have made us think about these tasks today. What a, what a, what a segue towards the end of the program. Um, <laughs> you've, you all made us think about these tasks. However, it's the summer holidays for many and it's going to be soon. So it's time to go and relax. It's nine o'clock. So it's definitely time to go and relax. Uh, thank you all of you for taking part um, and I look forward to a bit of a summer break and then more episodes of Resourceful after the summer holidays. Some great guests lined up, but <laughs> thank you, Pete, Alison, Jean and Adam for all your help as well. Thank you.